Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. I'm back in the booth after a summer away. Welcome back. Thank you. We got Tom in the house today. We're also videoing this so you can watch us on YouTube. Lord willing, you can, if you're that interested. Find out that I'm drinking from my Calvary mug today. Nice. Yeah. Tom's wearing a CU shirt. Go Buffs. We got a big weekend ahead of us. In the land of Boulder, yes, Coach Prime. That's right. And we've just come off the launch of a wonderful new series here at Calvary. But before we go any further, if you're new to Calvary, if you're unsure how to get connected, if you need to be connected, submit a prayer request. Always go to calvarybible.com. Click your campus. We love to hear from you. Find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. Get connected here at Calvary. This is a great season. You're perfectly in place with the fall launch to make that first step if you haven't made it here this fall. So go to calvarybible.com. We love that you would go there. And also check out the messages. If you're on one of those campuses and you miss a message, especially from this new series in the book of Revelation, check out those messages. Don't fall behind. Grab your scripture journal as well that we gave out this week. They'll be available the next couple weeks until those are sold out or given out actually more than anything else. But it's great to be here with you on the weekly sitting down with Tom. Let's jump into episode 114. So we're over that that hump. Let's go to 200. All right, so what's happening in Boulder these days, Tom? Oh, Jay, you're on the campus now. So if you've been around Boulder, um, we're in... An improvement phase. Yeah. You said phase two. It's really more like phase seven <laughs> or eight. But, um, you know, this building was built in 1977. And so it's 46 years old. And the sanctuary opened up in 1979. And from time to time, you got to update a few things. So we've got some carpet going in, some painting. And it's a little bit in progress right now. You have to have a little bit of imagination. But pretty soon... Uh, throughout the year, we're going to upgrade some things. It's exciting. Yeah, that's really exciting. I heard that over the, well, the spring now heading into summer, you had AC in the sanctuary for the very first time. Yep. Now, honestly, in the early years of Calvary, we had swamp coolers and they were pretty efficient. But after 40 years, they sort of gave out and weren't doing the job. Mm -hmm. And so it was an exciting day to feel air conditioning in the worship center yeah you just imagine people this summer especially in august in colorado coming to church and sitting without ac well i give thanks to all the faithful people who hung in there over the last 10 summers when it was usually pretty (laughs) warm but it's pleasant now thank god for that yeah make sure you come to the early service (laughs) no no we've got air conditioning for both services no that's wonderful and so this phase we're getting up updated with some colors if you've been on the erie campus thorn campus we have some some color palettes that have changed over the years and boulders finally getting those as well. Right. Some grays, some hues of lighter colors. <laughs> it's important. We're, stuff. we're coming along. Yeah. We're it's important along. stuff. Yeah. It really is. 46 years. You said we know 46 years of this building. That's amazing. Building. Just yeah. think about all the people that have come to Calvary. Over you know, those 46 years. Um, I guess one of the distinctive marks of Calvary is we've invested a lot of money in people Yeah, and the progress of the kingdom. And, you know, we've let our building go a cup a little bit, and yeah. uh, we're trying to upgrade as we can. Yeah. Uh, but I thank God for the ministry that's happened, for the people who have been faithful through all the years as uh, we've we've moved along as a church. Yeah. So that first year that Lucy came to Calvary, what was your first impressions of the building and, you know, the place and Boulder as you sort of investigated if this was your place? You know, it was 1992. We drove in the parking lot with our two kids in the back seat, and we drove in the into the church parking lot. There was a grove of trees that isn't there now, and there were four deer in oh, in wow. the grove, and uh, that sort of locked us in here. This was a cool <laughs> place. Now now there's houses around here, but, um, yeah. you know, one of the distinctive features of the Boulder campus is there are about 10 entrances. <laughs> so it's really hard <laughs> to figure out what door to go in and which way to get around. It's getting a little bit better, um, but... This has been a place where, thank God, he's done a great work. Yeah. Um, sort of in spite of some of the limitations. Yeah. I tried to do my investigation before we started this podcast. 
from what I can tell in the sermon archives, have you ever done the whole entirety of Revelation? No, never have. Okay. Never have. Of course, we've done uh, the opening chapters and the closing chapters, but yeah. we haven't done a sweep through the whole book. Yeah, we've referenced it. There's some, there's some references on the sort of the search menu of the archive sermons, mm-hmm. especially when we talk about our doctrine of end times, return of Jesus Christ. We've referenced a lot of oh, yeah. the book and, over the and years. And preached a number of the chapters, yeah. uh, particularly the seven churches in chapter two and three yeah. and the end. That's pretty neat. Yep. So, you know, seasoned in ministry, now you're going to actually go through the entire book of Revelation. What is what is sort of the idea or what what were some of the conclusions that you came to in order to say, yeah, let's I think this is the right time to do it. I'm getting old and I've done most of the <laughs> other books. <laughs> and so we were sort of figuring out what what books haven't we done that we really should do. Mm. And uh the, the other thing about the book of Revelation, which makes it uh, challenging, is there are a number of ways that the larger Christian community have interpreted the book of Revelation. And uh, so it's a, it can be a little bit daunting to map it out, mm-hmm. um, you know, knowing that many people have their chart already figured out on, right. on where everything is, and many people don't know anything about the book of Revelation. So you have a a very diverse audience in terms of prior knowledge of the book of Revelation. So that that's a bit of a challenge. But, you know, as we've begun to study and prepare and map out the series, there's a huge sense of excitement mm-hmm. that we're going to really be able to look through the book of Revelation and see the primary themes, the major themes, which we hope to major on. Right. And, um, you know, sort through some of the more obscure and difficult passages in a way that encourages people to keep studying the Word of God. Right, right. Now, being in ministry long enough, I don't think I've ever seen actually a church preach through the entirety of the book. And if you do your church history, you know that many of the faithful who have come before us have stayed away or shied away from the entirety of the book as well. Oh, yeah. And it's rarefied air for a church and a pastor to take that on. Well, we'll see yeah. how it goes. Yeah, <laughs> you might we'll be regretting it. We may find out why, why others haven't. No, I, I don't believe that. Yeah. I, 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 here's why. The book of Revelation has these promises in it that blessed is the one who hears, who reads, who keeps the words of this prophecy. Chapter 1 and 22 say it. And both. there are seven blessings. There's okay. seven pronouncements of blessing in the book of Revelation. So what if in a season of spiritual humble, humble Mm -hmm. study of the Word of God, our church experienced the blessing of God that's promised in the book of Revelation that we just look at it, cling to the things that are absolutely certain, Mm -hmm. wrestle with the things that are difficult to understand, and, um, you know, trust God and experience His blessing for looking at it. I think the reason that uh, the blessing is is because it reveals Jesus, right? It it begins the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? So it's going to uncover who He really is, as we've never seen Him. Yes, you don't see Him in other places. Certainly, as you don't see Him in His first coming. In right. His first coming, He was, um, it was an obscure coming, uh, in humiliation, uh, in a manger. And when He comes again, He's going to come in authority and power and glory as the great King. Um, you know, it's a beautiful contrast. So we usually think of Jesus at Christmas, and uh, what if we started thinking about him more as the coming king who could come at any time? Uh, That would be a blessed experience. Yeah, I have a question around that with John himself. So John, maybe the beloved disciple of Jesus? I think so. Yeah, wrote several books in our New Testament, wrote even a gospel, sort of understands who Jesus is in some ways, is on the island of Patmos. Mm -hmm. exiled yep and he sees jesus in a new way that he doesn't even know sometimes it seems like from my reading that he he's blown away at what jesus looks like well the visions he saw were pretty spectacular right and so he is seeing jesus in a different way it's described in the opening chapters and then throughout but um if you remember the incident when peter james and john were taken up on the mountain with jesus and he was transfigured before him and they 
sort of fell down in front of him right. because for a brief time he was seen to be the glorified Christ with the glory that he had before he became incarnate. Um, that was a snapshot that John had during the ministry of Jesus. And now he's on this island, he's taken up into heaven and sees this vision of Jesus in spectacular, glorious splendor and wisdom and authority and majesty. And he just can't describe it right. en- enough. I and mean, it's just like, whoa, this is my savior. Right, right. And John, probably at this time, is what the last disciple probably all of them have been killed mm-hmm. um in some way yep over the church history of what we know sure a lot of we don't know but he's left to sort of finish out the new testament this yep. way yep. super interesting so you mentioned four ways in your sermon you mentioned four ways to read the book poorly mm-hmm. i think these are really helpful especially to come back to them over this season yeah because i think I found myself in some of these categories at one time. You know what I mean? Like when I tried to read or understand. Yep. What are the four ways to read the book poorly? Well, because some of the language is what we would call apocalyptic language. It's um, heavenly visions trying to be communicated with human words. Um, there there are ideas that are uh, challenging. They're just not, I, they're not images that we think of commonly. So uh, many people have put a, a frame onto the book of Revelation and says, well, it's really like a crystal ball. Yeah. And we use the image of a crystal ball. It's like, okay, we got to find out what the future is. It's predictive of events. Then it's really kind of mysterious. So, uh, but it's not a crystal ball, yeah. even though it's prophetic and is predictive of the Lord's return and his judgment and other things that are coming, going to come at the end of human history. It's not a crystal ball. And the other is, a lot of people think it's a, a mysterious code that needs to be cracked. Mm. And so uh, that was another image that we said, we just have to figure out what all these little uh, images and visions and symbols and yeah. beasts and demons and dragons and what they are. And you got to crack that code of like what a it Da Vinci is. code. Yeah. 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 And a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to figure all those things out. Right. And I'm not sure that's the best way to think about it either. Uh, third way is uh, because of some of the spectacular imagery, uh, it's like a sci-fi right. novel. And it's novel. You know, yeah. it's not true. It's it's a novel. Right. And it's science fiction, a fantasy book. And it can't be that. Mm-hmm. Is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's not that. And um, other people would say, well, and many have, it's too hard to understand. Let's just lock it up and leave it locked up. Yeah, and that's and super interesting alone. stance. Um, but as we said, I think by diving into it, there, there's blessing, there's revelation for our own hearts. And I think the book of Revelation, you know, um, these are the other things we said on Sunday. There's a part of the book of Revelation that it was a historical letter to be circulated among the churches. So it had to have some really clear, specific application for those readers in their time, in the first century, in the Roman Empire, in light of what they were going through. So, um, And I think that's a really good point that people don't understand. It's like, these are seven churches you can, seven cities you can still visit. Yep. They're archaeology. Like, it's just amazing that the Bible is still there. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like that, no. the, these towns real are places. still real places. Yeah. And Revelation is written to these real churches. To the real churches. With real problems. Right. Real opportunity. A- and because it was written to them, it was written to encourage them to faithfulness, mm-hmm. to endurance, to comfort mm-hmm. under times of difficulty with a culture that was not a part of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. So they were called to live in the kingdom of God under the true king who wasn't there anymore, but was coming back to um, to comfort, console, direct, encourage, elicit their worship. So um, you can't lock up the book and say it's not inter- it's not for us. It really is for us right. because it was for them. That's right. You said you talk about this king and this kingdom come and the king coming back for this kingdom or to this kingdom. In your opening sermon, you gave, I think, five descriptions of Jesus that we find out really early on in the book of Revelation that I think should be really 
anchor posts for our way in which we read the book. Yep. And if I could just um, start by saying for everybody who's listening at Calvary and uh, you're watching this podcast and you're thinking, how do I read the book of Revelation in the days ahead? If we're going to be in this for four months, how do I read it? One of the best ways to get the most out of our study in the book of Revelation is to have an eye open to see what do you see about Jesus as we go through this book, yep. and what what do you learn about him, about his uh, the way he's described or the way he acts. And as we did this Sunday, you know, you, you go to the opening verses, and I've got them here in front of me, but it there's about eight different titles. Eight, I, I count. Well, five I I didn't the, get them because some of them were in the second half yeah. of the chapter, but yeah, uh, we did the first half of the chapter, and in verse five. It says of Jesus, he's the faithful witness. Mm-hmm. So a faithful witness always tells the truth. So there's this image of Jesus. What he is revealing to John is going to be the truth about what God is going to do in all the cosmos in the near future. Right. You know, the time is at hand. He's the firstborn of the dead, verse 5 says. That means that he is the preeminent one who's been raised from the dead. His resurrection is different than anyone else's. I made the comparison to Lazarus, who was raised from the dead before Jesus was raised from the dead, but he's not the firstborn because he died again, and Jesus never died again. Right. So he holds this preeminent place that because he was raised never to die again, we have hope. In the resurrection. And our New Testament uses that phrase a Absolutely. couple of times. A couple. Firstborn yep. of the Absolutely. dead. Absolutely. Colossians, him. beautiful phrase there, firstborn of the dead. Right. And um, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Yeah, that's a really, that sounds like the Psalms to me. Yeah, well. It sounds like the Psalms. It, yeah. Ways. And that is the chart for the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is going to have this massive conflict between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. You know, that the, yeah. Jesus is the king of all the kings of the earth. And um, that sets the trajectory that Revelation is going to talk about human kingdoms coming to a close mm-hmm. and giving account to the coming king. And isn't, the, if I'm wrong, Daniel does this similar, but he closes that and says, you shouldn't Think about these things. He closes the book, and in Revelation, Jesus opens it up. That's right. About these kings. That's a good kingdoms. point. He said, uh, seal up the scroll. Daniel yeah. said, seal up the scroll. We're not ready. It's the time's not. It's not now. Right. And John says, you know, we can open the scroll. We're going yeah, to see it. Keep it here. open. Yeah. The king is. Get ready. Yeah. And it's a beautiful thing about the book of Revelation, I think, that we should keep in mind, that when John wrote it, he wrote it with the idea of, hey, you need to know what's coming. Uh, this is a warning um, for the ultimate judgment of the world and the return of the rightful king of all the creation of all the earth. Um, you, you need to know that that's coming. Yeah. So those are the first three things about Jesus. And then I just mentioned a couple more uh, in verse 8. He's the Alpha and Omega. Yep. You know, verse 8 is so beautiful. He's the Alpha and the Omega, which is the first and the last letter of the alphabet, Greek alphabet. And so every word that can be written or spoken um, is true of him. Mm -hmm. And I think Alpha and Omega indicates his complete knowledge of every word, every truth that could be spoken. He's the one who is, who was, and is to come. So he is the omnipresent uh, one. Right. He's not shaped by time, not held in time, mm-hmm. and he is the Almighty. So if you think of three words that we use a lot, this verse, Romans 1, 8, he is omniscient, mm-hmm. omnipresent, and omnipotent. Mm-hmm. It, there is nothing that he is not powerful enough to carry out mm-hmm. as the king of all the kings of the earth. Now, you're, you're getting into categories, just theological categories, and that's a big word. You're getting into categories that usually describe God when we talk about the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You like the fatherhood of God. Right. We're talking about the Trinity here that are assigned to even Jesus himself, given a very good, robust definition of actually the three in one. Yeah. I think that's super interesting. Oh, it's that we're describing some of the things that we normally would describe to God the Father, to Jesus himself. Yeah. Well, the Father's giving 
him the right to judge. Yeah. You know, he, he uh, is not unlike the Father. Right. They're the same. God, right. I and the Father are one. They share the same essential qualities and attributes of what it means to be divine. Mm-hmm. What it means to be divine is you, you know everything. You, right. uh, to, be, to be God, you are everywhere present. He was, yeah. he is, he is to come, not, not shaped by time or space, and uh, you have all power that you can do. Uh, you can execute your judgment and right. blessing as you desire. Yeah, it reminds me also of Jesus' own words where he says, if you want to know the Father, just look at me. Sure. You know what I mean? Like it's a it's a reiteration of that in a very different context than when he said that the first time. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, I think when you talk about these things, you have to get excited, right? You have to... It, it makes you want to worship. Yeah. First, it humbles you. Yeah, no, right. And then worship it has to spring forth. Yeah. So, you know, full disclosure, as we were planning this series, I will admit to having a little internal trepidation about how are we going to sort through all of these complicated things. And the more I got reading and studying, the more my heart became excited that this really is a picture of our great God. And and I pray that what will happen is people will see Jesus as we've never seen him before. Right. You know, we we see him as the one who's going to come and make all things right and sum up human history and enter into a new eternal kingdom um uh, where there is no tear, you know, every bless blessing will be ours. Um and to let that shape the way we live today. Right. Cuz so let's let's remember Again, this is a historical book that's prophetic and apocalyptic at the same time, but it was designed to give the first century readers an encouragement, a consolation, a a sense of being transformed in their life that something is coming down the road um, in history that is going to make everything here that we suffer through worth it. It's the coming king. And if it was that for them... I think the more we look at it, study it, meditate on it, it will have that shaping effect in us. And that's that's what I pray that it will be. How cool would it be if all of Calvary Bible Church on each of our campuses was comprised of a congregation that was so shaped by the idea Jesus Christ is coming to make all things right, that we live today loving the things that he loved and thinking about him and seeing him at any moment, and it really transforms us. Yeah. Paul encourages us to think of heavenly things. That's right. That's what we're doing yeah. here. Yeah. And and First John said, I, I use this verse on Sunday, um, we shall see him as he is, we shall be like him. Uh, therefore, everyone who has this hope in him that he's coming purifies himself even as he is pure. Yeah, so it totally. has a transformational effect if that's you're a, thinking that Jesus could be here. What is that, First John? First John 3, 1 through 3. Man, that's a good verse to memorize. Yeah, it's great. Goodness, goodness, great. goodness. Now you we you brief, briefly touched on how to read this book. Yeah, we have these journals. I love how Calvary provides these journals for everyone who wants mm-hmm. a journal. Yeah. I would really encourage people to read ahead, at least that chapter before you know they come to church. I would encourage you to get a pen and take your own notes. Yep, and write your own questions. Sure, because you're going to have questions. Send them into the weekly, and you'll answer them. Next <laughs> you week. know, all the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And and yeah. what they should do in their journal, Jay, is well, what all of us should do is just read and you look at keywords and circle them. Mm-hmm. And you if you look at a vision or or some um apocalyptic word or thought or phrase, you know, circle it and and some of your bibles have these key cross references and yeah. you're going to find yourself looking at those cross references and going to the Old Testament and finding this has some connection to something that God has done, said, spoken right. in the past. And uh, I, I believe the first century readers understood that. They were triggered by the phrase in Revelation, and they were thinking, oh, that's Daniel, that's yeah. Isaiah, you know, wherever. Yeah, totally. yeah, I think that's a really great, helpful way to read, as well as, you know, as I read Revelation myself now, getting ready for the series, I'm like, I forgot how much Revelation actually interprets Revelation. John tells you usually what you're seeing. Or Jesus, yeah, some, sometimes, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and absolutely. I, and you first have to go to the, it's the source of Revelation to find out 
what this means. Right. And then you got to go to your New Testament. Yep. And then you have to jump over to your Old Testament. So, you know, when you're reading a great concordance, that's an old word, an old book, but like a Bible gateway. Your cross-reference. Just cross-reference, cross reference, yeah. in your study Bible. Will get you into some places that you'll just be, it'll just bring great joy yep. to learn about these things. Yeah. And you have to, y'all mention it, and we mention it over and over, even when we preach other books, you've got to know your Bible. Mm-hmm. Like that's a really important part of biblical sure. study is knowing the whole counsel of God yep. and being really familiar with the whole counsel of God. Just as the first century church probably was pretty familiar with some of these old, te- old councils. Of God. Yeah. The whole yeah. counsel of God. That's right. Yeah. Now, uh, the one thing I would say to, to anyone who's listening to us, who isn't familiar with your Bible. Yes. That's, oh, I love don't, how you went there. Don't be intimidated. Right. Don't be intimidated. No oh, I have to know my whole Bible. Uh, I can't get anything out that of it. No, no, no. So good, Tom. Now, you, you need to just say, okay, we're getting um, some rich truth in Revelation. You you may not know the Old Testament connection, yeah. but it's a good time to learn it. It's yeah. a good time to go back and, and do it. So you, you don't have to know it all before you learn it as we go and god's going to bless us as we go yeah because let's be honest we're all students when we send into the word of god that's right yeah we never ever arrived right in it yeah that's a really good counsel tom i really appreciate that and you know in this season to be praying for our pastors as they prepare every week mm-hmm. praying for our congregation to stay unified yeah yeah um our emphasis this year at calvary is prayer so this is a great time to really buckle down Learn how to pray. Yep. By reading Revelation, you learn who Jesus is. Yeah. Could I say? Yeah. When, when I closed out my message on Sunday, I said there's three things the Revelation should lead us to do. It yep. should lead us to be holy people, mm-hmm. knowing that we could see Him at any moment. So, one of the responses to studying Revelation: let's keep our lives pleasing to the Lord. Right. The other is to be waiting on Him uh, in a sense of hope. He's coming, so we're hopeful. You know, we. Yeah. The, it, it may look like the world is going to hell. Yeah. It may seem like a tremendous disaster right now. Where is God and all the crazy things that are happening in our world? No, no, no. We know how the story ends. We know Jesus is coming. He's going to make things right. Stay hopeful. And the last thing I said is be witnessing because the time is short. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so what an awesome time this would be during the study in the book of Revelation announcing that Jesus is going to come and the world's going to end. You need to be ready. Let's lead people to know and love Jesus Christ. And we just had a story this morning at church that one of the guys was in, in the office, Gary was in the office, and somebody walked in, he led him to Christ. Right. And I thought, fantastic. And I, I, I pray hundreds of people will come to know Jesus during this study. Yeah, I'll join you in that prayer, Tom. That's a wonderful. Thanks for sitting down with us. My pleasure. Giving us some of your time, some reflections of your last preach. And we look forward to this season as we hear from you, from God, and uh, get to do it together. Thankful for that. Yep, my pleasure. Hey, Calvary, we're so grateful for you. Thanks for tuning in. Like always, you can reach us at theweekly at calvarybible.com, as well as don't forget to go to calvarybible.com, find out what's happening And we look forward to seeing how you get connected and your faith grows as you follow Jesus here at Calvary. All right, have a great week.